the battle order, the schedule of operations for this great airborne landing in Germany, I took up a score of pages of typewritten foolscap with appendices and charts and timetables and maps. By reading it, you could see how immensely complicated is such an operation. In fact, how great a triumph today has been for Allied planning and execution. The Germans had said that they were ready for airborne landings. They were not, I think, expecting anything quite as powerful and concentrated as this, the biggest airborne force ever carried in one attack. It was British and American flying parallel within easy sight of each other, the Halifaxes and the Stirlings towing their horses and hamel cars, the Dakotas each drawing their two wacko gliders. Around us all, giving encouraging flashes in the sun, dashed the little fighters, British and American too. Some from bases in England, some from the forward airfields on the northwestern front. Slowly, I thought contemptuously, the great air fleet moved into Germany. It was so long that the head of the procession was now passing us on its way out. A sterling shot by with flames coming from its belly. Four white parachutes fled from it and opened and swayed off down to the river bank. The sterling crashed in a great gout of flame. You thought of the human element then. I looked back to see it through one of our rear windows and caught the eye of Bob Wade, my engineer, crouched over his apparatus. I knew that he'd seen it too. Ahead of us, German flak was staining the sky with its blue-black ink spots. Another tug went down, flaming. No one got out. The tail broke off a glider behind us and went spinning away. The glider paused a second as though surprised, and then reared up and fell, somersaulting. There are no parachutes in gliders. We were almost on the dropping zone now, the patchwork of fields that I'd seen marked out on large-scale photographs, lying below us in the glare of the sun and a dazzling mist. We called up Hamilcar 277 for the last time. You are over your dropping zone now. The Halifax skipped a little as the glider let go. We turned sharply, and a great bunch of flak turned with us just off the starboard wing. 277 wheeled away beautifully, and then I lost sight of her as she joined the hundreds of others, banking silently down like a flight of tired moths, seeking their rest on the ground. And as we turned, I saw simultaneously the smoke of five aircraft blazing like torches in the fields and the woods just below. Some German guns fired, and the typhoons who were patrolling on the lookout for just such a thing swooped and were gone down in a flash to strafe the gunners. Our fighter protection had been first class, but you can't subdue everyone, and there were some of our force who paid the price for hauling their gliders to the right spot at the right time. We, who were lucky, edged out of it and belted back for the Rhine, where Allied guns were setting up grey smoke clouds and Allied craft were crossing the broad river. There were tanks closing up in the winding roads of the West Bank and great convoys of lorries. Below us, the army was on the move into Germany. And back in the flax stains and the mist, its spearhead was now on the ground and fighting by the empty hulks of the gliders, among the black pillars of smoke, the funeral pyres of some of those whose pride it had been to lead the spearhead in.